Okay, <laughs> I'm going to introduce you to Esther, a friend we invited today to talk about Brazil because she knows a lot about it because she's coming from there. She's hanging around for a couple of years already in Germany and is doing an awesome, interesting PhD about um, DNA of bugs. Yes, <laughs> virus. <laughs> And um, yeah, she's an anarchist. She's interested in anarchist theory and environmental topics. So that's how it comes, all of that together to the presentation today. And yeah, you have the word. <laughs> thank you. So first of all, thank you for the invitation. And thank you all for being here. So it's a pleasure. And that's a light in my face. So welcome. I'm sorry if I commit some mistake, I'm a bit excited, so <laughs> nervous, but let's start this tema, this, that is not so nice, but August 2019, Amazonian forest burns. The smoke cover some cities in the north region of Brazil. Here you can see some pictures from some cities in the state of Rondonia. The fire could be seen on the roads. Here we have some satellite images from NASA from 11th, 11th August 2019. So you can see some smoke fogs, smoke uh, points in the states of Amazonas, Pará, Rondonia, Mato Grosso, also in Bolivia. And in 13 August, you can see uh, more points of smoke in the state of Mato Grosso and Pará. And in this map, you can see the smoke river that comes from the north and goes through the south. Soon, the smoke river, a smoke river was formed, and the smoke river followed the southeastern part of the country and went to the most southern regions, going to the ocean. On 19th August, São Paulo became night at 4 p.m. A smoke fog covered the complete mega city and it, it rained, it rained black water. Here you can see a satellite photo from NASA from this smoke river. How does it happen? So here we have some explanations from Bolsonaro, the president. First he said, it's normal. It's dry season there, he means Amazon. It's dry season there, that's, that's real. <laughs> and fire is actually a bit normal. But this was 200% 200 more, 200 more than what we have seen for the last year. And it was above the uh, average of the years. Then he said something like, what can I do? There is no army there. And then he said that the environmental ONGs were doing that on purpose to incriminate him because they don't have money anymore. So can you believe that the environmental ONGs would put fire in the Amazon because they don't get finance, finance aid anymore? So, but until there, the burn of the Amazonia was not in the international media, it was just in the region, regional media in Brazil. And some days later, when it arrives to Sao Paulo, it was in the um, media on, in, the, in the country, but it was not such a huge international appeal. But it changed. And then some explain, explanations need to be, to be provided. First, <laughs> Bolsonaro said to a journalist, you, he means European, you destroyed all your forests, so you, which moral do you have to say something to Brazil? So <laughs> apparently, 
this would be an explanation for something. <laughs> and uh, after attacking the media, he also attacked Macron, and they fight on Twitter. It was quite interesting, if you <laughs> want to give a look. It was not easy. And he said that it's very sad that Macron wants to use this sad news of, news of burning of Amazon to his own political interests. But I'm not going to talk a lot about Bolsonaro and his fights with other countries because of that, because Amazon is burning, and we have to ask why. I don't know why these lines appear here, so I'm sorry for that. Just ignore it. So, we can ask ourselves, why is Amazon burning? Nature occurs because it's dry season, and yes, there is a normal fire cycle, so if you haven't heard, uh, there, are, there is an ecological field of studies that is called fire ecology. So fire can have and has a very important um, role in to, to keeping biodiversity in some regions, in some biomes. But not a um, huge fire, but localized points of fire, so natural fire that occurs because it's dry season and the vegetation is very dry. But in Amazon, we cannot explain what's happening, what happened, just with this natural, uh, fire of, natural cycle of fire, especially because Amazon is a raining forest. Do you remember this? So why is Amazon so dry? Because of human cause. So we have deforestation. Deforestation is amazing. It's huge this year. It was uh, a record of this deforestation in Amazon again. And deforestation makes the, um, the forest drier. Why? Because when you cut the, the trees, you're uh, having less trees to transpirate. The trees, they transpirate and they take the water at the soil and bring it to the atmosphere. And they, they create real um, atmosphere rivers, you know, rivers that flows and control and organized all the atmosphere in South America and in the world. So when you cut the trees, you have less wet in the atmosphere, and it's why you have more dry in the raining forest. And it's why you have less raining. Um, burning trash, because burning trash is a kind of habit of some people in some regions where there is no a good management of, management of trash. So these this, this places, they accumulate trash and there is not a good uh, uh, government or governmental organizing management of trash, so they burn the trash and this happens especially in Amazon region, in the cities. But this cannot explain why natural reserves were burning. Uh, Burning land to create pasture, to put cattle, to create uh, cows. This is very typical, and this can explain a lot, and we're going to give a look. So, actually, this dry season in Amazonia is also connected to, uh, to, the fire, to, to induced fire from, from farmers, because they want to burn land to create new pastures, because after burning a piece of land, a grass, a very fresh and green grass, will have quickly be born, and so the, pet, the cows, they can eat this very nicely. So a lot of people does it. Also to open the forest, to take away the forest to plant. But you have to remember that most part of the land who are burning are natural reserves, are natural forests, and also indigenous territory. So What's happening? Burning areas for agribusiness, especially for plant soy and having cattle, this is also part of this. We're going to focus more on this, every of these uh, topics. Probably a mix of both. No? We can imagine it's dry season, deforestation is a huge uh, fee. Level is <laughs> in a rude level, and people usually burn land to make pasture. So, of course, 
fire gets uncontrolled and it can be criminal. People can put this fire to criminally burn forests. But probably these fires in uh, Amazonia has a huge participation of human cause. We, we have humans burning the forest, and we're going to discuss why. Do you remember it? I said this, the most part of the forest burned was part of natural reserves and indigenous territories. So here I, I brought some graphics for you. This first one, it's uh, the rate of deforestation in some years in the, the so-called legal Amazonia. Legal Amazonia is the part of Amazonia that is led in the law uh, recognized as the Amazonian. So you can see that we have a huge peak in 95, and this can be uh, explained by this was the year of the one year after the Real Plan, the new uh, new currents in Brazil. And they also started to get a lot of agricultural credit, of course, for big agriculture industries, and. In, you can see the other big peak is in 2002 to 2005. This is, this is known as the soy, soy boom, and we're going to talk about this soon. And here you can see, it's, uh, the second graphic is uh, fire counts in the period of 2012 and 2018, and in red, 2019. So we we have not finished the year yes, yet, but we can see a very accentuated curve. So we haven't finished the year, but it's a red uh, record. Yes? Put again? I can give you also the... the, the uh, the places where to find the other graphics. There are much more graphics also, if you want later. But feel free to photograph us. So, but then we heard about the so-called the day of the fire. So in 50 August, a local newspaper in this region here that I put it uh, in the slides, a local newspaper called Folha do Progresso, reported that local farmers want to burn, want to burn forests on the 10th August to show the president they want to work. In this re report, in this uh, newspaper, the farmers were saying, we need to show the president that we want to work, and the only way is tearing down the forest. The only way to clean the forest and form the pasture is with fire. And you can see here we have a, a graphic from the region, from Novo Progresso region in the state of Rondonia, or oh, sorry, of Pará. And in, in Novo Progresso, you can see the fires, the number of fire regist register in reports in every day of the month. And after the 10th of August and 11th, it became even more accentuated, so they were happening more and more fire. This was just uh, reported in this small um, Folha do Progresso, small newspaper, and it's not real clear what, what, was what was happening was really that some people, some big farmers, they wanted to burn the Amazon. And here we're going to talk about why, why these farmers want to burn the Amazon forest. Why people burn amazing forests in Brazil? First, I want to show you the, cause, the main cause of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon. This graphic is, 2000, is between 2000 and 2005, and you can see that cattle ranching was the main reason. So between 65 to 70 percent of the deforested land were used to cattle ranching, mainly to produce meat. So Amazonian, Amazon is becoming a huge pasture. And in the second place, we have small-scale agriculture. So in Amazon, the most part of the agric agriculture there is soybeans, is producing soybeans because the land 
is also not very well, not suitable for all many kinds of cultures because the, the, the soil is maintained by the forest. When the forest, forest is not, not there, the soil also doesn't have a lot of um, substrate and nutrients. So the forest, they keep the, the weather and they keep the soil. So something that grows in Amazonia is soybeans, and soybeans is something very important to Brazilian um, economies because Brazil exports mainly soybeans. And the second, the third was uh, large-scale agriculture, so, and then others, and logging uh, to make wood, you know, to sell wood. And here we have what I called, I told you, the soy booms. So you can see that between 2002 and 2005, it was a huge uh, a boom of soy production. Brazil started to produce a lot of soy, and this production of soy was related to a huge deforestation in the Amazon forest, because most part of the soybeans are planted there. But why so much soy? Can you, can you imagine this? Do we need so much tofu and soybeans? Do you think, <laughs> why, what, what are we doing with so much soybeans? So about 97%, uh, according to some uh, research, some research say something about 85%, I used soy of soybeans I used to feed animals. So these soybeans are not used to people, to human uh, food, but to cattle, to animal food. So you have, in Amazonian, you have land that is being destroyed, destroyed by produce meat or by produce soybeans to produce meat. And this is real. Here I, I brought to you the most the biggest exportation products of Brazil. You can see the iron ore is something very important and that Brazil exports a lot. And iron ore is also very connected to Amazon deforest and Amazon degradation because a huge part of the iron ore reserves in Brazil are concentrated in Amazon area. And I'm going to show you some mines later. Then we have the soybeans, which is also a huge cause of Amazon deforestation. And then if you look here, you have uh, exportation of meat. Of course, Brazil also eats a lot of meat, but it exports also a lot of meat. Here we have some photos of pro uh, meat production in Brazil. So I, all these white cows, they are for meat production. The cows, they are treated like this. The cows that are used to produce meat are treated some, somewhere else. And this... Uh, this uh, species, not species, <laughs> this um, type of cow is used to produce meat. And here there is a map where this meat is usually sand in the, sand in the middle. I have some graphics, but I didn't put here, but if you are interested, I have some graphics, graphics about the meat destination. So, and now we're going to talk about Bolsonaro environmental policy. Bolsonaro doesn't like environmental fines. He doesn't think this is necessary. So he is against all the environmental fines, you know, bills that you have to pay if you commit an environmental crime. He thinks that this is not necessary. Actually, he got an environmental fine in 2012 because he was fishing in a protected natural reserve. But he never paid this fine. He said that Brazilian has an environmental fine industry that just destroy the men of the land. I don't know if he knows who are the men of the land in Brazil, <laughs> but now he's planning to use this place where he was illegally fishing 
and it is a natural reserve, to create a fishing resort. Great, yeah? He's like a child. <laughs> But、mm, I think childs are not like that. Okay, he promised during his campaign less fines for miners, loggers, and big farmers, especially in the Amazon region, so they could deforestate more and have less problems with、uh, environmental law. He wanted to finish the Ministry of the Environment, but after a lot of social pressure, he decided to fuse it. With the Ministry of Environment,、uh, the first the Ministry of the Environment, with the Agricultural Ministry, but you have to note that the Agricultural Ministry fav- favored the agribusiness lo- lobby. So to fuse the Ministry of Environment with the Agricultural Ministry is to give the power of decisions to agribusiness. This is what、uh, is what's happening. Um, he's also not really interested in found Ibama. Ibama is the Brazilian Federal Institute for Environment, and Ibama is the res- responsible for、um, protecting the natural reserves and to fiscalize all the environmental if the env- environmental crimes have been committed and to give the fines.、Yeah? So, <laughs> so he is not really interested in Ibama. And he fired the director of IMPA. IMPA is the National Space Institute. It's a kind of Brazilian NASA. And he fired the director because the director of IMPA he made public data. He made data public. He made public data <laughs> showing the increase of Amazonian deforestation for some months ago, a bit, bit、um, before the Amazon starts to burn. This、uh, director he made. He just gave this data, data to, the, to, the, to the media, and it was a big scandal that the rates were new records. And Bolsonaro fired him because he said this was not a patriotic act. And you know, of course, if you want to be patriotic, you have to lie to yourself <laughs> and, <laughs> and to, <laughs> to science too. So. And he also approved many new agrotoxics to be used in agriculture. Many of them are banished in, in Europe and in the U.S. because they can be heavily potential damage to human、um, health. But now it's approved, so you can use whatever you want. And Bolsonaro has his. Environmental Minister Ricardo Salles. Ricardo Salles is the ex-environment secret- secretary, secretary of São Paulo, and he was condemned by environmental crime because he was、uh, faking maps to make、uh, natural reserves unities a bit smaller. <laughs> and as minister, Salles extinguished the Secretary of Climate Change and Forest. So it doesn't exist anymore because climate change doesn't exist, right? And who cares about forests? Now I will show, teach you how to steal a piece of Amazon forest. This is a technique used by、uh, <laughs> Brazilian landowners, so huge landowners. This is, it's not one of us, and it's called grilagem. So you have to learn this word because it's important. Grilagem. First, so our grillage tutorial. First, you have to be rich because if you're not rich, you're not going to do this. You have to be rich, and you have to find public land without document, without an ownership document. What's not not difficult in the Amazon region because many lands doesn't really have. It's a bit unsure which land belongs to who. The lands that doesn't belong to to someone, it belongs to the union, to the country. So you find this land, then you falsify land's ownership document and make it seems that this land was belonging to your family a long time ago. So you pay someone basically to do this, and then you burn the land because if there is no forest, there is no nature or protective law, and you can use this land as you want. So you burn this land also to to say 
that your family owns this, own, owns this land for a long time and there is no forest anymore there. And then you get the government to recognize your fake document and then you make your pasture, you bring your cattle and you continue to be rich. So this, in some way, of course I make it very simple, it's how grillaging works and this is a huge problem in Brazil because a lot of land, a big part of Brazilian land was steered by this process. So we can ask ourselves, was this fire in Amazon in 2019, was, was it part of an organized environmental crime with the goal of grillar public land, to steal public land? Because you have to remember, most part of the lands were burning were public land. No, one agri no, no agribusiness land was really burning. So, I, we can ask ourselves, who owns the land? Or how I like to, to call it, property theft. And then I, w I would like to remember with you a small little history. Once upon a time, there was land. An entire new world. This is an old map of American continent by Theodore de Brie, I don't know his name. And some people wanted to colonize this land. And two of the sail nations who, was, who were really navigating and colonizing land were Portugal and Spain. And Portugal and Spain, so they knew that there was an uh, American continent, they knew there was some land there, they wanted this land, and then we are not going to, to talk a lot about this piece of the history, but there are many financial interests and the uh, starting of capitalism, I believe you all know this, <laughs> this history. But there started some kind of conflict between Portugal and Spain. So, in 1494, Spain and Portugal, crown, crown, crowns, went to the Pope and they together they made a kind of uh, agreement. It's called Treaty of Tordesillas. And the Pope divided the world between the crown of Portugal and Spain. So the Pope and Portugal and Spain created this line, which is called the Tordesillas line, which divided the world between Portugal and Spain. Can you believe that the Pope divided the entire world between two persons? I will repeat, wait. The Pope divided the world between two persons. Yes, but then some decades after it, I think they realized that the world is, is a, a globe, and then they needed a second line to divide it into two. <laughs> so the second line was done, and this was how God divided the new land between Portugal and Spain. The king of Portugal knew that he needed to colonize this land before other countries like England, Holland, other European countries that were really angry because the Pope forgot about it, that they would come and colonize the world. So the Portugal king had a kind of, you know, a, a line, and he like made lines. You see, in, his, in this part of what's Brazil, I'll come back a little bit. Oops, sorry. So this part was Portugal part, and the king take his, ru his rule, his linear, and draw some lines, and he gave each kind of these lines to a noble Portuguese person. Great idea, right? This would work, I think. So you can, be, can imagine that land concentration in Brazil was really a huge problem, yeah? because like, first the world was divided between two people, and then it was a kind of ten people was running in Brazil. So then we're going to talk about a little bit about land concentration and development of, development 
of capitalism. So the capitalist development in Europe and the USA, it had some kind of level, some level of land reform. And this was not because they were nice, it was because it was very important for capitalist development. In Europe, for example, in England and in France, we had many peasants' revolts, especially in the Middle Ages and so. And during this uh, the capitalist development, the bourgeoisie made a kind of agreement with the peasants against the federal lords. And this resulted that there was some kind of distribution of land, you know, not, not equal, not for all, but it was a little bit more, and this was also important to create the internal market. So now, I would like to compare the de development of capitalism be between Brazil and US and see some points about land distribution and land concentration. So in the US, I will start in the US, sorry. The US, there was during the Civil War, you can see that the northern bourgeoisie was against the enslaved landowners of the south. So then you have the typical bourgeoisie that would be become the industrial capitalists against the typical landowner or feudal lords, the most kind of. The north winds, and they create the Homestead Act. And the Homestead Act created some level of land reform, some level of land division in the country. With the end of the war, there was the end of slavery. Slavery was very important for the landowners of South, but not to make, didn't make a lot of sin for the, the bourgeoisie, the new bourgeoisie in the country. And it creates this division of land, creates a kind of internal market. And we have the classic rupture between industrial capitalists and landowners that was very similar to what happened in Europe, as in England or uh, France, for example. In Brazil, there was no land reform. There was no focus on creating internal market. On the contrary, the focus was always on exportation of agric agricultural products and raw material, especially first sugar, second coffee, and third meat, more recently. So the landowners, sorry for this wrong, the landowners, they became the industrial capitalists. They were not fighting against them, they became them. And there was no rupture between these two segments, but a conversion. As a result, we have no distribution of land, there was no land reform in the capitalist uh, shape, and there was the longer slavery of the world, and <laughs> the land monopoly is really high in the country. And I think in the South America, it's a bit like this. So, less than 1% of landowners in Brazil own 45% of the country's rural area. Men are ahead, with, uh, men are ahead of 87% of the establishment, representing almost 90%, 95% of farms. Large farms with over 1,000 hectares concentrate 43% of agricultural credit. What it means is that these big landowners are the ones who are, become, who are receiving finance to agriculture in the land, not the small farmer family, but the agribusiness. Do you understand what I call agribusiness, right? Or should I explain better? Agrobusiness, I mean the big uh, agricultural, agricultural <laughs> industry. So, okay, large, large fam farms are being more financed, but the small farmers' families are the responsible for over 70% of food production. Who is producing food are not the big landowners, are not the latifundio, are not the agrobusiness, are the small Farmers' families, agribusiness, does not produce food. Agribusiness, what we call in Brazil, is latifundiar, is latifundio. Uh, they, uh, they have also historical conflicts with small farmers and indigenous ethnias. So if agribusiness is not producing food, what they are producing, I think you get already what they are producing, right? 
So, historical about land reform discussions in Brazil. In the 40s, there was already some kind of proposals of land reform based on European and US American acts, but there was no implementation. In the 50s and 60s, there was an increase of popular pressure for the so-called basic reforms. The basic reforms were not just land reform, but uh, there were political reform, there was some kind of economical reform, it was a package. But land reform was one of the most important topics inside of it. In between 1946 and 1962, there was the foundation of the so-called Ligas Camponesas, that you may, may know as peasant le leagues. So the peasant leagues were kind of land workers' union for land reform. Sorry. They had communist and socialist base, and they, there were some communist parties involved, organizing and helping, so and being part of the uh, so-called Ligas Camponesas. As, for example, PCB, uh, Partido Comunista Brasileiro, the Communist Party, they demand, sorry, land reform in a more socialist shape, not just, not just this capitalist reform, but a socialist idea of uh, land reform. They started in North Brazil, but soon they had sales through the entire country. They started like, more like a uh, workers' union, but there was a kind of radicalization of the movement, and they started occupying land and to have clashes with the police. This was in 62, yeah, that the Ligas Camponesas were a bit more organized. And what we had in 64, we had the, the coup de terre, coup d'etat, sorry, I don't know how to say this. <laughs> Pretend I say it correctly. So, in 1964, the le leftist president, Jean Goulart, also called uh, known as Django, wanted to install the so-called basic reforms, this packet of reforms that we already talked about, that was including also some uh, land reform. But in right wing, they know that the leftist groups were well organized in Brazil at the time. For example, the Ligas Camponesas, and also others. And, you know, they were, they were still traumatized by the Cuban Revolution. I forgot the name. The, the Brazilian right wing were, were really, was really afraid that some kind of a communist socialist revolution also occurs in Brazil, and Brazil is a huge country, so it would be a big problem for them. They would lose all the grilladas, the, the, grill, the grill age land that they already had. <laughs> so, the military coup d'etat in 1964, uh, it, they, they, so they, they did this military coup, so they took the government, the military took the government in, in March, in, uh, starting April, 1st April, 1964, and they said it was to avoid the communist threat in Brazil, and it was supported by the USA. And in this day, it's, called, it's known in Brazil as the day that lasted 21 years, because they said they would take the government just for one day, to avoid this communist president that wants to make land reform, but actually they stayed in the power for 20 on, 21 years. So this is called the day that lasted 21 years. And the military dictatorship started uh, attacking the Ligas Camponesas, the, compon the peasant leagues. So the Ligas Camponesas were persecuted, many members were imprisoned and also murdered, and between 1962 and 1989, about 1,566 Hura workers were murdered, and they had to withdraw the fights. So they were forced to withdraw. But they stayed in the rural resistance against dictatorship. And in Brazil, we talk a lot about the urban resistance during the dictatorship time, but there was also a huge rural, rural, resistance <laughs> during the time, and these people were there. Actually, I wanted to go a bit further. This, 
this part of the history, of course, you can imagine is really huge, and there are many topics to, to, to be talked, but we are going to make it short. After 1980, with the so-called redemocratization process, some modern versions of the peasant mo movements were created, and the one of them, it's not the only one, but the one of them, the biggest one and the well-known one, it's called MST, MST, Landless Workers' Movement. And the Landless Workers' Movement, they have a very Marxist base, so they are also very influenced by the workers' parties, by PT, the, the, the party that was uh, in the government before Bolsonaro. There was also the impeachment of Dilma. Dilma comes from PT, and it's a, uh, a party that it started as lefty, leftist, and we have a lot of criticism about this party, of course. But this is also something that is said that this movement is also so connected to this party when we analyze this with uh, an Akis point of view, because this party uses many times the mo this movement. Um, they are for popular land reform, and they occupate. They they also occupate land as the, the previous legal companies. And they occupied all non they occupied non productive farmer land. And they start they, they fight to have this land for its for their family. So there are many different so MSC is really huge. There are many families inside of it. Some families they already got some some land, some we call assentamentos, and some are still fighting for it and they are always uh, occupying other other land also. And they also they do a lot of different kinds of acts. They do a lot of different kinds of activism also. But um, they also produce, so these families, they produce about 70% of all the food in the country. And they are the biggest producer of organic food in the country. And they have many kinds of food street market. So if you, if you go to Brazil one day, you may see some kind of Food, uh, food street market, and they, they, they produce, they are not 100% organic, but they are studying to become even more, and I think they are about 80% organic. Uh, yeah, so I, there are many other kind of modern peasant movements, but I'm not going to cover all of them. So I will just show you some, an example. There are some other movements that are more autonom autonomous and um, not so directed uh, close to, to uh, parties, but we are not going to, to see that in detail. And we have also the indigenous movement. So the indigenous reserves, they have very well preserved forests. They, the indigenous, uh, the forests inside of indigenous land are the ones that are more preserved. While the deforestation rates in Brazil is about 20%, if you look just inside of indigenous land, the deforestation rate is about 1.9%. And the indigenous people in Brazil have a lot of conflict with miners, lodgers, so people who want uh, wood, and with the agribusiness. And there are many deaths. It's, a lot of, it's very violent, these clashes and these conflicts. Um, Bolsonaro's government wants to reveal the extension of m some indigenous land already regularized. And he also proposed many times the economical exploration of indigenous land and natural reserves. Here we can see the march of indigenous women in Brasilia this year. Just to illustrate. And as I told you, the mine industry is going even more in the north, uh, in the way of north. So, the largest iron ore mine in the world is located inside of a natural reserve in the Amazon forest, and it's called Carajas Mine. Bolsonaro government also wants to explore a huge copper mine uh, area called Henka in a protected region in Pará, amazing. Is th there are also some indigenous land there. 
And another mine is also being discussed. It's a Niobium mine in the indigenous reserve of Raposa Serra do Sol, in Roraima, also in the Amazon region. I don't know if you have seen in the media the disasters or the, the, the problems with the mines that have exploded and killed some people and destroyed some village. They are all iron ore mines. And iron ore mines are concentrated in the state of Minas Gerais, where I come from, and the state of Amazonia. And uh, in the Amazonas region, not just in the state of Amazonia. And as I show you, showed you, iron ore is one of the most important exportation products in Brazil. So, of course, they want to explore it. And Yobium, I don't know if you have already heard about it, but it's a huge discussion because actually Brazil is already a bigger producer of Niobium, and the market doesn't need a lot of it, but Bolsonaro thinks that it's a good idea to destroy a huge part of Amazon forest to produce more Niobium. Also, when um, a lot of ex specialists, experts, already told him that if he does it, the Niobium price would be very low, because a lot of Niob Niobium would be available to the industry, and the industry used just a little bit of niobium to work with iron. So they, uh, they, just, they just need a little bit, they just need a lot. But Bolsonaro said that it's still a good idea because we can also do jewelry with niobium. <laughs> so, to finalize, I want to come back. Uh, to some questions of the land. I wanted, at, at the beginning, I wanted to go more into Brazilian fascism, but I imagine it would be very, very long, and uh, I imagine that you already know a lot about fascism and how it developed, and I imagine Amazonian and ecological questions are a bit more important, but we can do this another time. I would be very happy. So I'm not going to, to go to the history of fascism, but let, let's to some comments. First, I wanted to make very clear, to say very clear, that agribusiness does not feed the world. The huge uh, agricultural industry, they are not feeding the world. They are producing soybeans and meat and killing us. Capitalism is not just producing what we need, actually capitalism is making us need things that they want produce, or that they can produce. And there is no green capitalism, unfortunately, <laughs> if you want to think one. There is no green capitalism. Capitalism is the opposite of a green idea. We cannot change it to make it, make, to make it green, because it's not just local, it's a global thing. And capitalism needs to uh, give products to one, capitalism needs to destroy a huge place. And if it's not happening here, and it's happening there, if not happening there, it's happening there, someone needs to pay the price. And this is capitalism. So there is no green capitalism, there is no way that we can reform it to make it more ecological. And there is no sustainable development inside capitalism. Land is equal to autonomy. We just have autonomy if you have land, if you can work with land. We can have our own way to work with land. And land autonomy should be a human right. I don't know if it is, but if it's not, it should be. Because we, we have the, not just we, but all living creatures that live in this planet should, be, should have the right to get their living from the planet without destroying it, and without creating an ecological disaster. We can do it. Protect nature is fight capitalism. We cannot be okay with capitalism and trying to protect nature at the same time because it's not how it works. And we have to fight capitalism also in its fascist shape and not just trying to reform it. Coming back to Bolsonaro and Amazon. Yes, Bolsonaro he represents nowadays the austerity and fascist face of capitalism in Brazil. He is the well-known fascist idiot from Brazil, right? Can you say other name? <laughs> I beg not. <laughs> so, <laughs> and 
Bolsonaro wants, yes, he wants to continue the capitalist plan to conquer the land because land is autonomy. If land does not just belong to capitalist purpose, we don't have autonomy and great, no? And to do that, capitalism will destroy forests, will burn the Amazon, will burn all the forests, indigenous peoples, more farmers, and all other alternative or so-called traditional ways of existence and production until it, ju it just least capitalist produ production and we can just live inside of what they planned for us. <laughs> um, and now, of course, Bolsonaro, he has this plan, this horrible uh, environmental policy, but do you think he, can, he came with this idea alone? Of course not, he just represents capitalism now, and it's what I wanted to make it very clear. Bolsonaro is very well known as an eccentric character, and it says that he was crazy, like Trump. It was crazy. Trump and Bolsonaro, they represent what's happening in capitalism right now, as also um, IFD represents what's happening. So this represents a new fascist uh, wave, a new fascist uh, reason rising in this austerity times. He is not just a crazy character, and this is, I think, it's very important to say because if we just make it a point, Bolsonaro is crazy, of course he's a jerk, but Bolsonaro is crazy, we are not seeing the completely structure that led Bolsonaro to, to be the president. So he did not come with this idea alone, he represents capitalism now, and most part of this trend, this trend of destroying the nature and to capitalist purpose, could be seen in other former governments, right? Bolsonaro is doing his, his part, in the moment, in the historical moment, that it's our, everything is allowed. And of course, he's a jerk. So, <laughs> this is what I wanted to bring to you. Thank you. And I'm really curious if you have some comments or questions or discussions. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> I have the microphone, so if anybody has a question. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, very insightful. Um, I just remember before the elections, there were some newspapers in Germany reporting that Bolsonaro is like the candidate uh, of the market, which was uh, something the uh, Deutsche Bank um, was saying. Um, do you know anything about how um, banks, in especially German banks or uh, from the US, also profit from this new type or this increased um, destruction um, of uh, Amazon. So not, I, I think it's not only the uh, rich people of uh, Brazil who are profiting from it, but I think there is some international support from uh, other institutions. Can you, um, yeah, do you know anything about this? No, of course, uh, the profit of destroying Amazon is not just Brazilian profit. A lot of capitalists in all, all the world is profiting. I cannot tell you of one bank, the name of one bank that is profiting from it. I do not know. What I know was that uh, I think SPD was supporting Bolsonaro a little bit before uh, he was... Uh, yeah, in the, his campaign, and soon they said, oh no, Bolsonaro is horrible, and don't help Bolsonaro, don't help fascists, it's like what they're supporting. So I know more this, involve, this, this, this relationship between SPD and Bolsonaro, also they helped his son to organize some propaganda from his, like some uh, advertisement for his campaign, but a specific bank I cannot not really tell you, so I'm, I'm not sure, sorry. More questions? Um, do you believe Bolsonaro will be re-elected? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, 
Actually, this is a question that I, make m I ask myself sometimes. But um, what I, I have seen is that m some, some people that vote for Bolsonaro are really n uh, disappointed with his government, but I have not seen researches, opinion researches, to ask how much is his popularity. I, I, I read that his popularity at the beginning of his uh, uh, government dropped a little bit, but I don't know how intense it was. Actually, I will better respond to this question because I'm, I'm flying to Brazil next week. So I really hope <laughs> I can get a better um, idea of uh, what's going on and if Bolsonaro can be re-elected. I hope not, of course, <laughs> but many people really uh, advocate for him and he has a huge fan base. Like, uh, he's a YouTuber, as you know. <laughs> Bolsonaro is quite a YouTuber guy. And he has a huge fan base and many, many people uh, vote for him. Many people believe that Bolsonaro will correct Brazil, but more in a more moral way, you know. Because I think many of uh, social movements, they, they, gone, they got stronger in the last, time, last, last year. So the feminist movement, the LGBT movement, the, uh, there was also, there were many more laws for, for example, domestic uh, women that work in house for rich people with this, the middle class, the rich class hated it. So this, they advocated a lot that this was a destruction of uh, the ethical and moral values of Brazil and uh, all this religion appear. So and Bolsonaro always, he put himself as a, the guy that believes in God and makes everything for God, that they wants to keep the, the values and the moral and the, this ethic high. So many people just I think they just see that, you know. So you went a little bit into the landless workers movement, but what else do you think is happening in terms of resistance, also in terms of ecological resistance, and what do you think are the best sort of strategies to approach this new sort of like uh, fascism and also like uh, the ecological destruction? Good question. Um, there were some um, pro protests and people were protesting for Amazonia and against Bolsonaro. There were many kind of protests. And in Brazil is one of the countries that, more, that killed more uh, environmental activists. So the number of environmental activists that were killed in Brazil is really high. And to really go to these areas, to the Amazon region, or to areas that really have a huge conflict between miners, loggers, and agribusiness, and native people, MST, <laughs> is really, really violent, uh, very ri violent areas. So um, I think the, the ones that are not doing this are many kinds of ONGs, and they, it's why Bolsonaro also hates ONGs, you know. If something happens now, if the light goes back, <laughs> Bolsonaro will say that was an ONG, so he really hates it because I think they are the ones that are doing something. So the foundations are not there, so the Amazonia Foundation is at risk, so we don't know how much money we have to, to the IBAMA and the CMB or people to go to these areas and do their job. And a kind of autonomous ecological, there are many kind of ecological uh, movements, but I, I don't know how effective it can be and how, which, how can we a range so can, can we take be strong to be against that because it's it's really a huge power that these people have and autonomous ecological movement i don't i don't know many of them but more like mst is huge and out of like Greenpeace and wwf this kind of movements i don't know others <laughs> a lot of others i don't know, really know but i how we can make it work, so if 
it's a good question. I think we have to really have more this culture of uh, being in involved with environmental fights because like, when we live in the, the, the cities, we sometimes we don't have a lot of don't know a lot about it, and you don't know what people are doing. I also don't know everything, what's going there. And also, we don't have this idea, so we cannot help them. So a lot of people are dying there, ecological activists and so, and we don't even know. But sorry, I cannot answer your question. <laughs> Is there a hand, or...? Um, I think I've read something about um, the Bolsonaro regime also being connected to um, evangelical, evangelical Christ, like Christians, but in a really radical way. Um, can you tell something about that? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, these neo-Pentecostal religions are very strong in Brazil. They always become stronger. So, and they, they have this idea of making like kind of uh, evangelical pursuit. Pro uh, that I think it's very connected to this, this question of morals, that the moral, the ethic is being destroyed by the minorities movements and they have to keep this, this moral high. So in Brazil there are, there, is, there are many, in the parliament, there are many congress people they are related, directly related to church, and church are huge industries in, in Brazil, so they, have, they don't pay fees, no? and they have a lot of power, so they go cheap, deep into people's head, and they also do, like for example, now the, all the drugs against drugs institution uh, are commanded by, um, uh, by religious people. So it's not the, the social service that is doing the anti-drugs work, like taking the people that are really addicted to drugs and uh, helping them, but the church doing this. And of course, they do, do not, does not do, do that, but they also catechize people. And I know many people that went through drugs uh, rehabilitation and became really religious fanatics, it's a kind of scary. But they have a lot of power, they have many, for example, uh, television uh, channels, many television channels are owned by church, and also industries, and they have a lot of Congress people inside of parliament that are priests and that come from this church, and in Brazil there is this, uh, people say that they, there is this big Congress people group that is the uh, bullet, Bible, and kettle. So they, they work with kettle, bu bullets, because many of them also have connected connections to militias and to uh, military, and so and also Bible. So it's, it's very important there. I don't know exactly. I forgot which church Bolsonaro belongs, but he always brings this. Uh, church uh, discussion, this religious discuss speech all the time, a bit like Trump. Okay, if there are no more questions, then we call it the evening. And I think, ah, you have a question. A short question at the end. Um, do you have any social media channels where you can get um, some information from you about from this me. topic, yeah, because you, you have a lot of information, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so for me, I don't really use social media, but you can, if you, if you want more um, information, I can give you some uh, indications of medias, but they usually are Portuguese. <laughs> so I have to... One, one place where I read very good uh, political analysis, but n not really from this environmental part, but more like um, Bolsonaro uh, and also the impeachment of Dilma and how the impeachment of, of Dilma is connected to Bolsonaro was on crime thing. They have really good analysis. So some people from Brazil, they also uh, write texts for them, I think, because some texts I have seen in other anarchist blogs. 
before and they went to crime things, so they have really good material. And um, about ecology, I can give you some, some links later, but I have to think about it. Um, regarding your question, uh, I have one tip. It's a journalist, um, uh, which is uh, actually a correspondent, a free correspondent in Sao Paulo. He's uh, called Niklas Franzen, and he has a uh, Twitter account, and he tweets regularly about uh, news from uh, Brazil um, regarding indigenous movement, uh, women's movement, and um, yeah, problems uh, with uh, the government. I have some, like a kind of, I prepared a kind of links. It's not very well organized, but if you want, if some of you, you can just copy this from my computer. There are some links, some tests in Portuguese and some tests in, uh, in England, in, in English, and from some different blogs, from some anarchist blogs, from some normal newspapers. So if you want, you can also copy this in my computer. Okay, then thanks a lot for your talk again. And uh, yeah, thanks for all of you being here. I think you will be here a few more minutes if some more questions pop up. Sure. Thank you.